Okay, we are uh, joined here in the studios in uh, Brooklyn here with, uh, we're joined by Marcy Smith. Uh, she is, she teaches uh, in the Department of Economics at John Jay uh, College, CUNY. And we're I'm really excited to have, in fact, I've been kind of hoping or dreaming to get Marcy on the show ever since I heard her interview uh, with Doug Henwood, who also has a great podcast um, about, I don't know, a little over a year ago, because it was really the first time, which is which I just find incredible. It was the first time I had heard, I know of anyway, uh, of a of a really serious good left critique of Gene Sharp, who we're going to talk about anyway. First of all, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Thank Marcy. you. I'm glad to be here. So I, let me just try to because Gene Sharp is this kind of murky character. Let me first try to introduce before we actually start talking about him and why we should care, let me explain first mm -hmm. why we should care, I think. I'm going to give a couple anecdotes here that I pulled from your um, your great article. In fact, I want to first uh, uh, tell readers to read your article. You can find it. It's called Change Agent, Gene Sharp's Neoliberal Nonviolence. Uh, this is part one was just published. Mm -hmm. It's at nonsite.org. That's N-O-N-S-I-T-E dot org. Uh, and so I guess part two will be coming up shortly. And, this, and part two will be more about his influence on the Western left, right? Whereas mm -hmm. part one was more about situating him in um, in sort of U.S. imperial mm -hmm. structures. Yeah, um, precisely. Yeah. And it, it's really great deep dive. Thank it, you. And again, it's just, it blows my mind that this hasn't been done on the left until now. And we'll talk about that. But first, let me, just to give you an example of his importance, and you'll have to remember here that Gene Sharp is somebody who's been vouched for in a pretty big way by, you know, so left luminaries such as, you know, Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky. Uh, and this is also will be part of, I think, you know, the story that we'll have to talk about. But uh, here's a couple of quotes I'll give just to give you a, a sense. Uh, Max Boot, who we've talked about a lot in this show, um, you know, one of the leading Waffen twerps, uh, <laughs> neocons in this country. He wrote, uh, "It is fair to say that Gene Sharp and and Peter Ackman, who we'll also talk about, which is another crazy story, uh, that Sharp have been directly uh, have been indirectly responsible for more revolutions than anyone since Lenin or Mao, helping create numerous liberal democracies." Uh, and when Ben Smith, who you know better today, is uh, the editor of BuzzFeed. Uh, since its beginning, but when he was at Politico, he named uh, he named Gene Sharp the most influential American political figure you've never heard of. That was taking from a big profile on Gene Sharp uh, in the New York Times, and that had to do with the um, the Arab Spring and and specifically the the Egypt Revolution and Gene Sharp's role in that. Gene Sharp, just to give a quick background, he's basically the brain bug uh, behind all, all the, 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 the color revolutions, Arab Spring, and the whole kind of um, strategic ideology, I guess, of nonviolent color revolutions, which have become so deeply embedded like in our, in our culture and our expectations today on what revolution or so-called revolution is supposed to even look like. Um, I personally run into, before I before I actually even knew who Gene Sharp was, I reported on a couple of his revolutions. I happened to be in Kosovo. I was in uh, mm, right. uh, the, um, on, on the Mitrovica side, on the Serbian side, living there when Milosevic was overthrown and really kind of the first really effective color revolution. They'd worked on it for a long time, and, and the NATO bombs did help a lot. But mm -hmm. ultimately, um, you know, the... the the Atpour, this organization that was um, influenced by Gene Sharp, it turns out was, this was the Atpour, which kind of then spawned so many other youth color revolution movements. Um, this is where Atpour comes from. I remember it in Kosovo Mitrovica, um, all the stenciled clenched fists, which mm -hmm. then you start seeing in every color, like you... You know when you see a stenciled clenched fish that the uh, the State Department <laughs> the is The branding it. is really consistent. It's true. <laughs> it is. Uh, and so I saw that one. And, you know, but but it, the funny thing is it was, most of it was very unpopular, especially with people under, let's say, 40. Very unpopular. They With 
people who are anti-imperialist and anti-left, I'm saying in Serbia. Um, and so it was one of these things. It's something that I think the sharp color revolutions take advantage of. And again, we'll get to that later. Mm. So the next revolution I saw, I was down in Georgia in 2003 for the color, for the rose mm. revolution. Mm. And I was actually the first to report on, hey, wait a minute, this looks a lot like what I saw in Serbia. And then I found out Richard Miles, who was the ambassador mm. in uh, Hungary during um, the color revolution in Serbia, uh, was the ambassador in Georgia. I didn't even know about Gene Sharp at this time, but it was clear that there was involvement of George Soros and State Department again. And then, oddly enough, it was Edward Lomonov. Um, after he got out of prison, after he was imprisoned by Putin, he got out of prison, led the, the opposition to Putin, and then when he helped cobble together um, a sort of broad coalition of anti-Putin activists, Lomonov wrote for the exile, um, Lomonov being a a, you know, a radical. Um, a, a, he teamed up with Boris Nemtsov, who was assassinated a couple of years ago, hmm. and Garry Kasparov, the lunatic uh, chess player, um, and hmm. who David Remnick loves. And basically what happened was Washington people gave Lomonov and the other leaders of this, what they call Other Russia movement, which was actually Lomonov's branding, the Other Russia, Drugaya Rossiya, um, they gave him Gene Sharp's books. And Lamont have asked me, do I know who Gene Sharp was? I said, mm. no. And then I started looking him up. Wow. And at that point, Lamont didn't even want to talk about it anymore. So interesting. Yeah. And what became clear to me over time was that um, the Kremlin people got into Gene Sharp pretty quickly. And they then created their own youth movement, counter color revolution groups, very consciously did so, actually. Mm -hmm. And and aped a lot of those tactics, you know, there's 198 um, sort of nonviolent tactics in, in that one pamphlet of his that are that are very good at sort of subverting people's power and belief in, in you know, in the power structures of the state. Um, they kind of turned them around and used them against the opposition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and incidentally, Sharp did actually write about that as well. He wrote a book called The Anti-Coup, which I'll deal with more in part ah, two. Oh, interesting. OK, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll be curious about that. So anyway, so, um, you know, uh, again, the, the Orange Revolution in 2004, the same clenched fist, um, the same structures, the same kind of, you know, uh, uh, National Democratic Institute and um, and the uh, Institute for what was the International Republican Institute, you know, the two kind mm -hmm. of color revolution funders behind it. I remember I knew because in the exile later on, we wound up getting a couple of investors from the expat community, including somebody from the marketing world. And his friends from Burson Marsteller were telling him how deeply involved Burson Marsteller was in branding and organizing the Orange Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, there's another side to all this stuff, too, that doesn't get much play. Um, but uh, but again, it looked so similar and they, they were just kind of coming one after another. Boom, boom, boom. And then and then when the um, the Arab Spring came around, suddenly it was a lot more out in the open. Um, talk about Gene Sharp and yeah. profiles on fawning profiles on Gene Sharp. Mm -hmm. And he's portrayed as this kind of this almost Hollywood TV um, kind of nonviolent hermit guru who lives in this shabby yeah. little apartment mm -hmm. with books everywhere. And, you know, there's you, always a dog. <laughs> the orchids are always mentioned. Yeah, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. It's, he tends orchids. It's really, um, it's very Hollywood, isn't it? Uh, of the kind of the guru. And, you know, you would never know. Um, and it was not easy to find, actually, because I did look him up and I did look up the Albert Einstein Institute. I did some research on it, but it was like one of, you know, a million things I was juggling and it was hard to really get yeah. down in there, wasn't it? And like, yeah. as we've said on the show, as John has said, the internet makes it really easy to research certain things that happen to kind of dovetail with, I don't know, for uh, lack of a better way, you know, dovetail with what the state would want you to know, what the, what the Langley would kind of want you to know, right? Whereas it gets really hard to f find and dig. Even on the internet, it just becomes really hard to sort of uh, 
find yeah, out. I mean, some yeah. some stories go against the grain, yeah. against the mainstream, the consensus, whatever you want to call it. And those stories are usually the ones you should follow. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it, just to underscore that point, I've been working on this um, this piece for, you know, about about two and a half years. I mean, uh-huh. it, it's, you know, it's it's obviously rather long, so that perhaps is not so surprising. But mm-hmm. um, I, I think the two things that surprised me in the process is, in the process, um, number one, that, you know, pretty much if you look through my footnotes, this is all publicly available information. Mm-hmm. So so that was surprising. I mean, I wasn't digging into archives. I wasn't, you know, right. I, I did some of that. And, and the Swarthmore Peace Collection um, holds the Albert Einstein Institution's files. And, uh, you know, that, you know, if if I proceed and write a book with this, I'll, I'll go and check. But this is all publicly available. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really telling. And then, you know, Mark, as you and I were discussing Earlier, it is it is surprising that this hasn't been done, and and you know there have been uh, people to note. I mean, I, I think one of the reasons why we we see this spike in coverage of Gene Sharp around the Arab Spring is because there had been this sort of snafu um, uh, around Venezuela mm-hmm. um, with the uh, kind of a- a- arising um, from the the botched. You know, U.S. blessed, uh, you know, coup effort back in mm-hmm. 2000 and uh, 2002, two. and then also like, and all, but those protests just kept kind of, they they kept being ongoing, right? right. And then there was right. the recall, and there was this and that. Exactly, and yeah. Sharp, you know, it, the Albert Einstein Institution, in the wake of the coup, sends Colonel Robert Helvey, um, who is an Albert Einstein Institution consultant and also the former dean of the National Defense Intelligence College. And, you know, just to underscore this, that's the Defense Intelligence Agency's training institute. And, mm-hmm. the, you know, Defense Intelligence Agency is like the CIA, like, you know, the the NSA. It's it's one of the U.S. intelligence organs. And it is, it is stunning. I had a little... Um, uh, I, I had one of Sharp's supporters push back yes. against me saying that, you know, Sharp had associations with the defense establishment, but not with the intelligence establishment. And mm. number one, I would dispute making a hard and fast distinction between the two. But then number two, it, actually, he does unequivocally have a relationship with the intelligence community via Colonel Helvey. So Helvey goes down and he trains um, anti-Chavez activists. Um, and, and these are the activists who then press for the recall referendum, which, mm-hmm. you know, Chavez then handily wins again. Um, but that whole affair ends up attracting the attention uh, thanks to um, this uh, kind of the, the dogged reporting of a woman named Eva Golinger, who oh, writes a yes. book, okay, I've seen uh, her. Okay. and yeah. and kind of you know discusses Washington's you know longstanding efforts to unseat Chavez, right. and in that context discusses the role of the Albert Einstein Institution. And in reaction, there's kind of all this global pushback against Sharp, and that is when uh, you know there's a letter circulated to defend Sharp, and that's what Howard Zinn oh, and Noam Chomsky see. sign on to. So so this happens, and this is kind of running, kind of it, it reaches its peak in around 2008. And kind of so after 2008, Sharp has been established, I think, much more clearly as a character in the left imagination. And so it's almost as though he needs to be explained, mm. you know, so it's he gets even more sunlight. But the the narrative becomes, it feels to me, like a bit more, um, e- even more sort of fixed about who he is. Mm-hmm. Um, what got you interested, first of all, in writing about him and pursuing this? I mean, I know how it can be like spending two and a half years on something that, granted, this mm-hmm. is, this is as some of the quotes say, I mean, it really is one of the most, certainly probably the most important figure in kind of geopolitics or imperialism or activism, I don't know, of, of the last 30 years, the post-Cold War era, that has been so underreported or not reported. But is that is that what kind of drew you to it or what drew you to it, right? Yeah, to, uh-huh. um, the, the original impulse uh, came from the fact that I was from about 2006 to 2016, 2017, really involved in the U.S. climate movement. Mm. And uh, that was a real 
um, education. And so sort of in effort to explain just for myself, uh, you know, sort of the what were in my view some of that movement's limits and weaknesses and failures, um, I started sort of examining more closely some of the thinkers, some of the texts that circulated sort of without any sort of criticism, without any kind of, of critical engagement in, in the movement. And mm -hmm. um, this is where it led me. Right. Uh, that's really interesting. So you came to Gene Sharp and then all these color revolutions and the limits of these through your experience in the climate yeah. activism. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Otpour is referenced very frequently in youth movements, is my impression. I mean, certainly in the youth climate movement when I was involved in it in college and, you know, right out of college. Um, you know, Otpour is kind of a, a gold standard and you know, youth activists are sort of implored to to learn the lessons of Otpour and, and imitate Otpour. And, you know, there's no discussion at all about the real geopolitical context of, you know, what's going on in Yugoslavia when mm -hmm. Slobodan Milosevic is, is overthrown. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that seems to happen, and it's obviously not, it's not a bug, it's a feature in every color revolution is that whoever takes over almost invariably, or maybe invariably, happens to be pro-NATO, pro-Western, and mm -hmm. uh, much more neoliberal or just full-on neoliberal if the previous regime wasn't yeah. neoliberal enough. It just, it, that was the case, obviously, when Milosevic was overthrown. That's the case in the Rose Revolution, the Orange Revolution. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of these go bad. Actually, they they almost all go bad one way or another and lead to massive disappointment and they and usually lead to worse kleptocratic anti-democratic authoritarian regimes down the line within a few years you yeah know? Well, which raises actually that reminds me of two things i mean number one i do think it's it's important and i say this in the piece that it's this is not to say that people who show up for these protests are all hired hands and they don't right. have legitimate grievances they do you know that they they frequently do have legitimate grievances um, the, the reality though, is, as you said, you know, this pattern keeps playing itself out, you know, like people have legitimate grievances, they overthrow uh, a, a leader and the outcome is deeper neoliberalization, mm -hmm. you know, that that's worth like examining. And then secondarily, there, there's an interesting thing that proponents of strategic nonviolence, Sharpie and strategic nonviolence do, which is simultaneously argue that you know, not this this methodology of this kind of weapon system is, you know, more uh, more democratic because it requires kind of mass participation mm -hmm. um, in order to succeed. But then on the other hand, and we've been seeing this a lot in the Trump era, um, they simultaneously sort of, you know, encourage uh, minority movements by saying it only actually takes 3.5% of the population to overthrow <laughs> Uh, a, a quote unquote dictator, you know, <laughs> leader, mm -hmm. um, which I, I think, you know, of course, the only way that you reconcile those two things is if you define democracy as lack of public opposition, which is a very thin <laughs> version of democracy. Um, but I think that latter point is quite true. Actually, you know, you don't need that many people engaged no. um, in order to pull this off. Yeah. And also, in, in, in when you destabilize a country, I mean, if you if your movement and by design, as we'll talk about, you know, Gene Sharp's kind of nonviolent uh, kit does not uh, or pretends not to promote any particular ideology, which really mm -hmm. is kind of a default to to a, um, a liberal or neoliberal, uh, you know, idea is definitely not for socialism and socialist redistribution. It's quite hostile. Yeah, very quite hostile, hostile to, to it. it. I ask kind of an outsider's question that I think might apply to some of our listeners as well. What is the kit? I mean, did, first of all, should we grant that that Sharp and his co-workers came up with a, a new and radically more efficient way of overthrowing authoritarian governments? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, yeah, I, I have uh, asked that question, um, you know, more and more as I've uh, gotten deeper into this research. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, Sharp's 
goal was to try to take the violence out of war. And, you know, he, to some degree, I think, I think managed to succeed in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing to remember is that that doesn't mean that we don't have war. <laughs> it's still, you know, right. it's war by another means. I mean, and, uh, you know, well, I mean, we see something like this in, sorry, but we, we see something like this from the traditional war buff community that mm -hmm. we're talking about Gettysburg, we're talking about Stalingrad, that doesn't happen much anymore. War now is something that involves a great deal of ritual demonstration and media performance. Yes, and, and ideological and warfare and psychological mm -hmm. warfare. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. And he seems, if I'm right, he seems to have been in advance of that, right? He seems to have mm -hmm. picked up that rather early. He was very, very much in the vanguard. And, you know, uh, maybe we'll get into this, but I mean, I think the whole context around Sharp's early career, him being at this uh, Center yes. for International Affairs at Harvard, which is just this bastion of the kind of high Cold War defense, intelligence, security, policy development scene. Kissinger is there. McGeorge Bundy is there. Um, you know, uh, Samuel Huntington is there. Br Brzezinski uh, is there. Brzezinski is there. <laughs> yeah, um, you really know, they're nice. in close alliance with the MIT Center for International Affairs, which is another, you know, Walt Rostow is there. So it really is like the epicenter of um, the Cold War defense intellectual community. Uh, and, you know, when Sharp joins the Center for International Affairs at Harvard, um, the CIA at Harvard, uh, you know, this kind of inside ham-handed sort of <laughs> jokes. It's, it's very skull and bones, it feels. Mm. Um, the Department of Defense was at that time undertaking this huge, what was called the uh, Manhattan Project of Social Sciences called, the, called Project Camelot, which was um, basically this huge counterinsurgency study. $50 million mm -hmm. counterinsurgency study that's trying to uh, make, quote unquote, breakthroughs in peace research. Um, and, and they're trying to figure out how do we do ideological warfare better? How do we do uh, 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 right. psychological warfare I, I better? Remember, I remember your uh, quote from Helvey saying, you know, we have to find a way of doing this without killing people or something like that. That is, there's no <laughs> questioning of the goals. Mm -hmm. Most right. of the relative bloodiness of the methods. Yeah, yeah. And, and the goals, just to be very clear, are, you know, uh, you know, more freedom for the market. <laughs> and and that's been the theme, I think. And, 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 you know, Sharp has this book, Social Power and Political Freedom, which um, gets, I think, kind of noted a lot by his supporters, but I don't know how many people have actually read it. Um, it's very, it's, it's pretty big. Um, there's kind of a lot of repetition in it, in, in my view. So it's, it's kind of, a task to get through, but it, um, he's very, very clear in it that he see, you know, he wants to kind of eliminate violence. That's, it's kind of a very, um, idealistic, as many of the cold warriors were a very idealistic, uh, goal. He wants to, to use his phrase, advance love and human dignity and, you know, defeat violence and human degradation. So, you know, this is not a world of interests of bosses and workers. This is a world of, of, you know, mm. good and evil. And he sees the key sort of source and vector of violence in the modern world uh, to be the quote unquote centralized state. And so this book um, of his uh, Social Power and Political Freedom is all about uh, this idea of his that, that, you know, with centralization of the state comes more tyranny, more dictatorship, more war, genocide, et cetera. And he, in fact, argues that his politics of nonviolent action, this whole weapons system, which is, you know, it, it's a system. It's not just nonviolent protest tactics. It's embedded in this kind of weapon system that he calls political jujitsu. He sees this as a way to, quote unquote, diffuse state power. And he never talks about markets. He's very canny about this. He never talks about privatization. But he, you know, criticizes high taxes he criticizes government ownership. Regulation. Regulation. <laughs> even <laughs> regulation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he... It's he, very, it's very uh, Hayekian, isn't it? Sort it's of very Hayekian. Road, road yes, to serfdom. Sort totally. of like, if you start with raising taxes and regulating yeah. a business, the next thing you know, you're all in concentration camps yeah. and gulags. I, yeah. I encourage everybody on the left to read, <laughs> actually, The Road to Serfdom, <laughs> because um, I think we, we will realize how successful the neoliberal turn has been at sort of 
setting the terms of conversation even within the left. And, and I think Sharp is one expression of that. Mm-hmm. 